Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar organized by JetBrains. I'm Paul Everett, Python and web developer advocate here at JetBrains. I'll be your host. The topic for today's webinar is five ways to work bulletproof with data lore. That's pretty cool to be doing a data lore webinar. Today mm -hmm. I'm joined, and by joined, I mean I show up and she does all the real work, by my colleague, Dr. Jody Burchell, Python data science advocate at JetBrains. Welcome, Jody. Hi. It's been so long since you and I have done this. I know, I know, like a whole 48 hours. 48 hours, yeah. <laughs> So we're excited to do this one. You and I did that webinar earlier this week on pandas with Matt Harrison. We kind of hinted uh, at your first day with the company at the start of April. And what was it we made you do? Yeah, so it's so around a month before I started at, at uh, JetBrains, I got an email from Hattie. So Hattie's the head of the advocacy department. And he's like, hey, um, do you want to go to PyData on your first day? And I was like, ah. Oh. So I looked it up and I saw it was in Berlin. And I was like, okay, maybe it's a bit anxiety provoking, but I feel like it would be a missed opportunity to not go. So I turn up on my first day. I, I don't have my laptop. I don't have Slack access. I don't have email. I'm in the booth. And then people are coming up to me and asking me all these super specific questions about JetBrains products. And I'm like, it's my first day. <laughs> um, but obviously, it's the Python community. Like, everyone's so nice. Sure. So, you know, they, they were pretty much just teasing me about getting chucked in the deep end. Um, there were a couple of silver linings, though, as I predicted. Um, so the first was obviously because I didn't know anything about the products. I just spent heaps of time chatting to people and listening to their problems. And we just talked a lot about workflow issues with data analysis and data science. And then the second was I got to meet Elena, who's the product marketing manager for Data Law, and she knows everything about this product. And it was so cool because people come up and they'd be having the same sort of conversations with her as we were having, like I and other people. And then she'd be like, oh, okay, I think Data Law can help you with that. And she would like take them over and give a demo and they would just get super excited to see the potential for the product. So yeah, it was, it was pretty special first day, let's put it that way. And you got to hear her give the data lore pitch. And this is your first public webinar for data lore. So give us, from your perspective, the elevator pitch for data lore, who, what, why? Yeah. So I'm uh, excited about data lore as a product. So the way I see it is that it's a cloud-based data science and data analytics platform. And the idea is that everything from, say, accessing data, setting up your environments, accessing compute, and creating things like reports is managed for you. And you'll see more of this within the presentation, but the idea behind data law is that it removes this need for you to, have, uh, you to, you to work out how to do things like, say, set up a database or an S3 bucket connection, or how to get access to a bigger machine for training, or how to package up your notebook to present to a non-technical stakeholder. And what I really like about this is I don't come from an engineering background. So for me, I've kind of had to be dealing with a lot of these infra tasks for years and I don't like it. <laughs> so what I like about data law is it takes away the need for data analysts and data scientists to be doing this sort of work and allows us just to concentrate on the stuff we like doing. And I think this is a topic that's really dear to your heart, scaling down to individuals, but scaling up to kind of industrial strength notebooks, right? Yeah, exactly. And it's, you know, like I think everyone who's used notebooks before, you can, you see the power of them, you understand the potential and they are perfectly made for analytics and data science work, but working with them can be a real pain. So <laughs> data law is an attempt to solve a lot of those issues. And I think a very successful one. I hope I can. And I don't think data scientists want to wear a pager anyway, right? Mm, no, I, no, I did have to do that <laughs> at no. one point and it was fine, but not really in the job description. So this webinar is going to show off some of the really cool things in data lore. So let's get going. Yeah. All right. We'd like to make this webinar as live and conversational as possible. Jody and I are going to have a good time. Join in the good time with us. Think of some things that you'd like to ask. If you have any questions or problems during the webinar, feel free to ask them at any time. Don't wait till the end. Just ask them right here in YouTube. And we are beaming live in Twitch as well. Uh, we'll have a few pauses in the webinar where Jody will be like, Paul, got any questions? And I'll be like, yeah, Jody, we do got some questions. So we'll answer some questions right 
immediately in YouTube or Twitch, but we'll also save some for Jody. Please don't wait until the end. Ask questions as soon as you have them. What's always the first question? Is this thing going to be recorded? Yeah, it's YouTube. They record everything. So it'll be available basically immediately after the end of this. And we'll also announce it on our webinar. All right, now that we're all set, let's begin. Jody, you got some badass data lore stuff to show us. Give us some industrial strength notebooks. All right. And uh, first thing I want to say is, hi, Dina. I can see you in the, the chat there. Dina and I used to work together. So All right. Hi, thanks Dina. Thanks for coming. Give us some good stories about Jody. <laughs> yeah, she's got some. Okay, cool. So to set the scene, I've been talking about reproducibility for quite a long time. So I gave a talk on this topic all the way back in 2016. So I'm really feeling my age. And Looking around at the literature at the moment from the last couple of years and also at topics at current conferences, I'm seeing that reproducibility in data science research is really becoming a core concern for the field. And I think this is because we are maturing a lot as a field and we're starting to encounter an issue that software developers have had to deal with for a long time, which is maintainability, maintainability of legacy projects. So obviously reproducibility is a core concern for data science and data analysis in terms of maintainability. And what I wanna to do today is illustrate how you can build reproducibility into your work from the beginning using data law. So let's get started by looking at a definition of reproducible research. So we have a rather dry definition from CRAN, but what this tells us is that the goal of reproducible research is to tie specific instructions to data analysis and experimental data so that scholarship can be recreated, better understood and verified. So if we break this down, what this definition is basically telling us is that the core concerns of reproducible research is that your instructions, your data and your analysis itself are tied together clearly and that this presentation or bundling of the research work allows others, maybe including yourself in six months time, to redo what was done to understand what was done and to replicate or verify what was done. So how is this relevant to data analysis and data science? So as you would all know, Jupyter Notebooks are now one of the most common data analysis and data science development environments. So we did a research piece for data law, I wasn't here, but <laughs> the team did it um, back in 2020, and they were able to pull 10 million notebooks from GitHub using Python in Jupyter. So despite the fact that notebooks were designed to make the communication of analysis and research easier, a lot of research, recent research is finding that there are issues with the reproducibility of notebooks due to how they're written and stored. So what I'm gonna do is summarize some of the main findings from some recent papers on the reproducibility of Python Jupyter notebooks. So one of the major reasons that they found that notebooks failed was a lack of a reproducible execution environment. And the most impactful of these was in dependency specification, probably no big surprise. In one paper, they found that 90% of repos <laughs> did not specify the dependencies that they used in the original analysis environment. I have been guilty of this in the past though, so I'm not judging too hard. Um, and in those cases where the dependencies were declared, the environment couldn't be recreated more than half the time due to issues such as packages weren't publicly available on repos such as PyPy, or you, know, you needed to compile some of the packages in order to actually use them. And you know, they didn't declare the <laughs> compile and it required. Um, moreover, notebooks often lacked further information such as the Python version or the broader compute environment that was used, which I think is actually pretty normal. I wouldn't normally specify that, but it is actually needed for reproducibility. And then finally, although not technically part of the system setup, both papers have observed that a lack of access to the original data was a significant issue. So moving on to the code within the notebooks, several issues were noted by the authors. So both papers noted that the execution order of the cells within notebooks couldn't be reproduced around 75% of the time. And I was kind of surprised by this result and I was even more surprised when I found out that the, they were using the order in which the cells had been executed at the time of last commit, not the top to bottom execution <laughs> order. So it's quite a bad result, um, yeah. And um, they then found that even when they could run the notebook through with using the, like the, the last execution order, again, there are a number of dependencies that were trying to be imported, but they actually weren't present in the environment. And then finally, they just found that there were a lot of mistakes in the code, such as name errors, key errors, and general syntax errors. 
And then the final issue that the authors described was the way in which markdown comments were used. So as we know, markdown was included originally in Jupyter Notebooks as a way of encouraging literate programming, documenting what you did in a clear way. But instead, what the authors found was that markdown in the majority of notebooks tended to be used mostly for headers. The formatting options were often not taken advantage of, like tables or bullet points. And in particular, the use of markdown dropped off towards the end of notebooks, which suggests that work at the end and conclusions about the research were not being documented. And then, although not discussed in the two papers that I reviewed, I believe that there are two other components that are at core to reproducibility. So one is being able to keep track of changes that are made and then roll back to earlier versions of your work if necessary. I think that's a pretty, you know, core requirement. And then finally, as research is collaborative, it's important that you, both technical and non-technical colleagues are able to access your work and have their contributions documented if that makes sense. So I think the easiest way for me to think about reproducibility is to think about the questions you need to be able to answer in order to make sure your work can be reproduced rather than focusing on like specific things that are broken because a lot of things can break. So the way I think about it is in terms of five broad questions. So the first is, how did I set it up? What was my environment at the time I did the analysis? And relatedly, what was the exact data that I used? What did I do? What was my exact data processing, my analysis? What was my modeling? Can I read my code? And can I actually run my notebook top to bottom? Why did I do it? Have I documented my decision making and have I documented it in a clear way that I can understand later? When was it changed? Do I have the ability to see different checkpoints where important uh, changes to the research were made? And can I roll back to earlier versions if I screw something up or someone else does? And who can access it? Can I share my work with others in a way that allows them to replicate my environment and data? And can we collaborate in an efficient way? So as I mentioned, I gave this talk six years ago. And obviously back then I recommended the tools that I was using at the time as solutions. And um, what I recommended was virtual environments for dependency management, keeping track of the data that you accessed in code and in Markdown, using Git and GitHub in order to do versioning and collaboration, and then, of course, using Jupyter Notebooks with some recommendations for tidy analyses and using, you know, the Markdown in a rich way. And if you watch that, that talk, there's a recording of it on YouTube. You'll see at the end, you know, someone brings up very fairly that there are some issues with some of the tooling I suggest. There are technological barriers or there's, you know, suitability for the job barriers, particularly with Git and GitHub. And at the time I was just like, I don't know, I guess you just got to learn to use it and that's not the best solution. Um, so obviously tooling has moved on a lot since then and I think in particular, data law overcomes a lot of the concerns that were raised during my last presentation on this topic. So one of the reasons I feel that data law is such a powerful tool for reproducibility is it treats reproducibility as a first class citizen, meaning that from the beginning of your analysis, you're baking reproducibility into your work. And what I'm gonna focus on in this talk is presenting how we can avoid a lot of the traps for reproducibility by creating this all-in-one notebook environment within data law, which aims to retain the original, original development state as much as possible and also allows others to access that state. So last slide, and then I'm gonna pause for questions. Um, so for this talk, we're gonna be doing a very simple image classification project using the Fashion Mints data set from a company in Berlin called Zalando. Um, some of you may have seen this data set. It's just basically a step up from the digit classification Minst. Um, it's a fun little data set. So I chose this analysis for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I just don't wanna focus on the analysis too much. It's not really you know, what we're talking about, but I just wanna use it as a launching point for talking about reproducibility. But obviously you need something with a little bit of complexity. So you know, this analysis has some concerns such as dependency management, um, complexity of analysis, accessing data that are real world concerns that you would be facing with reproducibility. So let's pause for any questions. Um, was there anything? Uh, first, I had a question about um, when you're talking about reproducibility and getting some things that are publicly available and then seeing how they stand the test of time. And you're certainly right about dependencies 
not being pinned, Python version not being pinned, et cetera. Mm-hmm. But I, I wonder if you just have any anecdotal feeling about kind of the, the not the long tail, but the majority of add-ons and packages that people use, how stable are they across Python versions? Mm. Uh, you know, we, we've starting to, we're starting to see some Python versions get kind of end of life. Yeah. I wonder if any of these notebooks are using things that just don't work anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So a couple of anecdotal uh, examples that I have. So there were some packages like Pattern in particular was a or is a very rich um, NLP processing package. Mm-hmm. And it's an act like it was created by an, a university department maintained entirely by them. So obviously they're not necessarily going to be fully on top of it. Like probably the people who developed it originally might have moved on. So it was a 2.7 package, works beautifully in 2.7. And I remember I was messing around with it probably like four years ago, five years ago. And like it just was not available for Python 3. And it's mm. such a shame. Like I think they have started porting it over now, mm-hmm. but like, at that point, it was like one of the most powerful NLP processing libraries in terms of like text processing, but you couldn't use it unless you wanted to stay in Python 2. Mm. Um, another example, which I think pretty much all data scientists would know is TensorFlow. Um, it is quite unstable. <laughs> um, like you, it's not unstable. It's, it's very stable. It's more just it's very finicky about the version that it uses yeah. and Keras as well, like Keras laying over the top of TensorFlow. So um yeah this is definitely an issue in data science i don't know how much it's an issue outside of data science like is it an issue in web as well or you know it's an interesting point because uh when you think about data science you think about these enormously popular packages that are this much python and that much c and whenever you're starting to talk about shipping binary wheels my goodness, things get finicky fast mm-hmm. or you compile it yourself and you, and then you've got to have the tool chain locally. And then everything is really tied to the Python ABI binary interface. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I could ask you a question like, well, why, why not just do a requirements.txt file for a virtual end? Doesn't that just solve all the problems, but it's kind of moves the problems around, doesn't it? Well, yeah. And this is, this is the thing. So when I first discovered virtual ends, I really didn't have much experience with proper like in production data science. This Mm. was back when I was a baby data scientist, when I was really just like learning to walk. And I just thought they were the business. I was like, this is it, like this solves everything. And then I found out as you start updating your global Python version, virtual environments break. They don't work anymore. And so then I, you know, I worked my way up. I'm like using tools like Conda environments or poetry Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and they're great because they will include not only by default the versions of the packages you've used but they will tie it back to the specific python version but then if you're sharing that with other people you are tied then to the os so Mm -hmm. yeah and a lot of data science packages just do not work well on windows Mm -hmm. so you may not see the same sort of behavior if someone's trying to recreate your environment on a windows machine sure So for me, the only kind of bulletproof solution I've seen is you need to containerize it. So you need to basically specify Mm -hmm. the OS that you're using and tie it all together super tightly that way. It's what data law is doing under the hood, and I'll show you a bit more of it. But it's like in production, the only way to ensure that things don't break is just stick everything in a box. And... It needs to go all the way down to the, not quite like to the OS level, but at least with the sure. container, you are nodding to which OS you want it to lie on top of. So, All right. There's also a question about data lore and databases, but let's get into data lore a little mm. bit. Save it for the next break. Cool. All right. So obviously you can see on my screen the landing page for data lore. So I'm just going to give you a little orientation. So I've talked a little bit about what data lore is, but... Essentially, data law is an online environment that allows you to do data analysis and data science work within Jupyter compatible notebooks. I'll tell you why we call them Jupyter compatible and not Jupyter notebooks in a second. So as you can see, it's browser based. The entire platform is hosted in our AWS servers for the free community edition. And we have a paid professional edition also hosted in our servers. 
Um, but we do also have an enterprise edition where you can host the notebooks on your institution's own specific servers. So the reason why I'm calling these notebooks Jupyter compatible and not Jupyter is they do have a few alterations and additions compared to vanilla Jupyter notebooks, including a specific kernel mode um, that we've developed, and it's pretty cool. So hopefully you'll be excited about it. Um, so what you can see here is a workspace. So if I click here, you can see that I've got a home space that's more for scratch projects. And then you can create different workspaces, which are basically just project specific directories. So the idea of workspaces is you can share these with collaborators and you can also keep all of your notebooks and other artifacts within the same workspace. So for example, if I create a model artifact and I wanna keep that associated with a particular set of notebooks, I would keep that in my workspace. Same with data. Data that I have loaded into my workspace will be accessible to notebooks. And we'll talk a little bit more about uh, data connection in the coming um, section. Okay, so let's jump into how data law can help with answering our first question. How did I set up my research? So as we've already discussed, a non-reproducible environment is one of the main reasons that Jupyter notebooks can't be replicated. So obviously one way of ensuring that the research environment can be rebuilt is by permanently linking the environment with the notebook. And I don't just mean creating a requirements file and rebuilding it, I mean associating the built environment with the specific version of Python and the specific package versions permanently with a notebook. And this is the way that data law approaches dependency management. So what you can see, sorry, going back here, is if we create a new notebook, and we want to create an environment that's associated with it, we are automatically creating a virtual M. We have an option of either using pip or conda for that. And then we have a number of packages that are associated with, uh, well, sorry, built into our environment, imported in by default. So you've got a few different options there. Um, so what I wanna be clear about, and I'm gonna reiterate this a couple of times and I'm gonna demo this, a notebook is not linked to a workspace, it's linked to a notebook. And this means you've got complete isolation between the packages and the versions of the packages you're using between different notebooks. So let's have a look at this a little bit more closely. So here we have a notebook. And if I go over to my environment manager, you can see that I've used um, the default pip environment. And what that's done is it's installed Keras 2.7. The problem with Keras 2.7 is it doesn't include a particular method that I want to use to one-hot encode my target. So if I scroll down to here and I run this cell, you can see that we get an import error because this version of Keras doesn't include this two categorical method that I want to use. So let's go over to a different notebook, a different notebook in the same workspace. And let's see what I've done here with Keras. So you can see that I've installed Keras 2.9. And if you go over to essentially the package manager, you can see I've got the option of installing a lot of different versions of Keras. I just chose 2.9 because it was the most recent one and I knew I needed something beyond 2.8. So now that we've got the correct version of Keras installed, let's try and rerun this import. And you can see it's successfully run and not thrown an error. So again, what I want to reiterate is what I'm showing here is we have two notebooks within the same workspace, but they each have their own distinct versions of Keras and they're completely isolated from each other. And these environments will be permanently associated with these notebooks. I've been using these same notebooks for over a month and it's just been working no problems like a dream. Um, the other thing that I wanted to say is what happens when you use the environment manager to install dependencies is every time you restart your notebook instance, Data Lord will automatically reinstall anything that you've installed. So you don't have to rebuild that environment every time that you restart your notebook instance. Okay. So the next thing that I want to talk about is, as I promised, associating data with your notebooks. So again, this was noted as a major failure for reproducibility by the paper authors and it's really easy to see why, I think, for anyone who's worked with real life data analysis or data science. So, you know, for instance, you might store your data locally 
and be working locally within Jupyter. But then you commit your notebook to a remote repo and you don't push your data because it's too big or, you know, it's too sensitive to just have on a public repo. Or you're accessing your data through a URL, but then you get URL decay and it breaks and then you've basically lost the connection to the original data set. Or it could be that you've extracted a sample using SQL from a database, but because it's SQL, you decided to do it in a separate file and then you didn't link that file with your Jupyter Notebook and now you've got no idea where you got your data from. So data law attempts to avoid these breaks between notebooks and data by creating these persistent links between the data and the notebook. So what this means is that when your notebook instance starts up, you don't need to reconnect to databases. You don't need to reconnect to cloud buckets. You don't need to reload in data. It's just there persistently. So I wanna show you a couple of different ways in which data law allows you to access uh, data in a permanent way. So the first I wanna show you is database connections. So you can see here, we've got this attached data um, tab. And you can see I've set up here a connection to a Postgres database. And I know you were starting to mention databases, Paul. We'll get to that in a second and uh, I'll let you ask that question. So say I wanna read in data from my fashion minced table and I have it in this Postgres database here. Let's say I would just click through the schema and you can see that data law has completely introspected this entire database all the way down to the table level, allowing me to see even the names of col columns and their types. So just clicking out of this, let's say that I want to import data from this database. What I can do is I can create a specific type of cell, which allows me to write native SQL code. And this is why I'm saying these notebooks are Jupyter compatible, not Jupyter, because this is not the same as you would be accessing data through say like Psycho PG2, where you'd have to pass it to a string and then pass that to a connector. You're actually able to run SQL and even get code completion. Yep where it will give you suggestions for things like table names, column names. I know I really like this feature. It's much more elegant than having to like pass everything as a gigantic string. So if I run this, it'll just take a little while to get this. Um, what it's going to do once it finish run, finishes running is save the results here to a Jupyter, uh, sorry, a pandas data frame. And this means that I can then go down in the next cell, which is then a Python cell, and start using this data frame object immediately. So I need it in NumPy, this data, in order to use it for my model. So I can just easily convert it with one line of code and voila, I have my data and I have a permanent connection to the data that I obtained and the query that I used to obtain it. Similarly, uh, if I don't want to access from a database, say I just have CSV files, if the CSVs are not too big, what I can actually do instead is I can just drag and drop them to my workspace files and store them permanently on the data law server. So like I literally just drag and drop these from my local directory and they upload it and they've been here since middle of May. And then in order to access them, it's just as easy as though they were a local file on my local computer. And I even get, again, some code completion. So can see I'm getting suggestions for the files and if I run this I get the exact same result as I did when I was querying that data from uh, the SQL database. So I find this a really really cool feature because to be honest I've been in so many analysis situations where things have broken because I just didn't know what the data was and especially working with SQL it is clumsy and you really do have to make compromises normally where you can't actually do native SQL queries unless you're using, say, PyCharm, where it's also supported. Um, but it's just really nice just having that native SQL connection. So yeah, I'm gonna pause here. Any questions, Paul? Let me go off mute. Uh, we saw in the dropdown real quick, the types of databases supported. Um, mm. What are the types of databases supported now and as a self-defense against people who watch this and bug us later, any idea, any other kinds of databases that are being considered? Mm -hmm. 
So let's go down here and have a look at new database connection. So you can see, you know, the biggies oh, are connected, yeah. Redshift, MariaDB, Transact, SQL, MySQL, Postgres, Snowflake. And then there's quite a lot of specialist databases yeah, that are also yeah. connected, uh, supported, sorry. Well, Athena's not specialist. Um, CockroachDB. Um, I am not actually entirely sure what's planned. I know that they are actually planning to support a couple more database types, um, cool. but I'm not clear on the roadmap at this point. Right, so cool. we can, yeah, we can send that message over. And... I, I suspect it's similar to the rest of the company. It might be a JDBC drivers needed and that's the way it talks to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Kind of a, another question, it's just about Data Lore's view of the world, view of the Ooh. notebook concept as well. Um, when does it make sense to pull code out of separate models, uh, out into separate models versus kind of leaving it in the notebook? This is a notebook best practice, but maybe mm. Data Spell's got a spin on it. Yeah. So the thing is with data spell, because you've got this concept of a workspace versus an individual notebook, I think it's really important to make that distinction for your project. Mm -hmm. So, and this is, this is a really like core concept of data spell. There is an idea that there are specific things that you want to link only with a notebook. And there are specific things that you want to be available to all things within a workspace. And both of them are important to reproducibility. Yeah. So as I've already talked about environment management, that is a notebook specific um, relationship and so is actually data connections normally so say by default this connection that I've done to this data um, database is a notebook specific thing but if I go back out into get out of this uh, into my landing page you can see that I can actually connect to a database for the entire workspace. And I can also connect, um, you know, drop data that will be available to all notebooks. So to come back to the, the question about modularizing and pulling out code, in my mind, the difference is, do you need that code to be available to multiple mm -hmm. notebooks? Because I'm no software developer, but I have had to work with legacy projects before and legacy projects written by a combination of data engineers and data scientists. And they both had their advantages and disadvantages in terms of readability. Obviously, the code written by the engineer was much more elegant and better for productionization and more efficient, but it wasn't necessarily more readable because sure. things were pulled out to a degree where it, it was, yeah. Whereas the yeah. code written by the data scientists was very linear, but then there was you know, some inefficiencies where they hadn't necessarily reused code that maybe could have been reused and that actually would have made it more readable. So I was right. I was watching a PyCon 2012 video yesterday. Stop writing classes that oh. encouraged people to not put so many indirections in their code to improve future readability. Uh, you said something in the first segment that sounds a little bit like this. You're talking about People, can I, maybe I can use the British expression, can't be knackered to write their requirements, their requirements TXT file. But the future you is going to hate you for this. And so it feels a little bit like taking a little bit of extra time to take this out of a notebook, put it into a durable abstraction. Yeah. It isn't just helping your colleagues, it's helping the future you. Yeah, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit in the next section, but I think it's also like this is a lesson I've had to learn. So um, at the job I actually worked out with Dina, I wrote an entire app myself by myself because I was the only Python person on the whole team. Everyone else was a Java dev. So I could have asked for help. There were some very like competent Java, uh, sorry, Python users on the team, but I don't know. I just never showed this app to anyone else and I like coming back to it later because I worked with a bunch of very good engineers I was like why did I never get them to like peer sure. review my code because I had to go back six months later and modify my own app and I was like what the hell is this like why did I write this so I don't understand what I'm doing so yeah like it, it's it's funny but like as much as we like to think about data science and we like to think about software engineering as 
very hard disciplines. There's a lot mm. of art that art, goes into yeah. all of them. And the core for me of creating good software from a data science perspective, at least, like because we're not normally thinking about production efficiency, is communication. It needs to be clear code that communicates well to all audiences. And it's sure. because notebooks are research documents. Mm -hmm. So the core of like a research document, like whether it's a paper or a report or a notebook is other people can understand it. So, yeah. And That's keep understanding it in the future. We did get a quick answer. Um, it is correct that DataLore uses JDBC drivers under the hood, which means like DataGrip, our IDE for databases, uh, MongoDB is a supported database. Oh, perfect. I was actually wondering about Mongo, um, but this was something I thought about like an hour before the webinar, mm. so I didn't uh, end up looking it up. Yep. Cool. So shall I chug on? Sure. All right. So let's pop over to this gigantic notebook, which is diving really into the proper content. And we're going to be moving on to the next question, which is, what did I do? So when is it not possible to answer this question? And I think this is actually the most complicated question. So this is probably going to be the meatiest part of this presentation. I say probably, I know it is. I wrote this presentation. I've rehearsed it quite a lot. So this is the meatiest part of the presentation. So I think anyone who has come back to an old piece of code or an old analysis or an old notebook knows that there are many reasons that you might have a failure to rerun or reproduce your results. And broadly, the way to tackle this is what I call tidy code. And when we're talking about notebooks, it's tidy notebooks. Make sure that everything can be run top to bottom. Make sure your code is readable. Make sure that you understand what you've done. So let's go through this a little bit um, in a little bit more detail. I'm going to give a few examples of things that I think can really help. And again, I'm not an engineer. We're not coming at this from an engineering perspective. These are common sense practices that I think anyone who has a bit of Python experience can pick up. So... The first thing that I want to talk about is modularization. So we've already talked about, you know, the idea of pulling code out of your notebooks in order to make it more re uh, readable. I just want to go back to the simple concept of creating functions. Functions are a great way in order to tidy up your code. If there's something that you need to do more than once, it's generally good practice to functionize it because Otherwise, you're just going to be re repeating code, you're going to be changing parameters manually, and you're going to make mistakes. And it's not going to be as readable. So as we talked about, though, the problem with modularization is that you are introducing a level of abstraction. You start to break the connection between the work that you're doing and the code that you wrote to do that work. So it's really important that you enrich your functions with a lot of information. The same goes for classes, of course, but I'm just going to talk about functions because to be honest, I don't tend to write classes. Full disclosure, you know, I'm not a production engineer. I'm a data scientist. So, you know, so there's certain very obvious principles like give your function a really clear name or give the variables within it a really clear name. If you're in a hurry, I know it's really tempting to give them names like func1, a, var1. Problem is you're never going to understand what you meant later. And then take advantage of internal features of functions like doc strings. Make sure you always include a doc string to at least explain to yourself what you're trying to do with this function. Even this sentence, which to be honest could be better, gives at least an overview of what I'm trying to do. And I haven't even really talked about what my input um, variables are doing. On the topic of input variables, uh, something I started doing a couple of years ago was explicitly declaring the input and um, return types. Yeah. I actually saw a very nice talk on this at PyCon Paul. Um, it was one of the keynotes, and it was talking a bit about this. And I, I was doing it already, but it made me kind of twig that this is such a great way of increasing readability. Because say for this uh, particular function, you can link back one of the input types, which is a bit weird, with this keras history that I've imported. So immediately it's obvious, oh, I'm passing a keras history object to this function. 
And I'm also just passing the number of epochs and then I'm going to output a data frame. It just makes it so much clearer what you're trying to do. Okay. So another thing that really helps with tidiness, and let's go down the bottom to see this, is avoiding mutating variables and assigning... Real quick, I'll get the oh, yeah. link to Luca Schlanger's, I think it's Luca. Yes. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. It was. It was such a good talk. It was... Well, obviously it was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I really, even again, not being an engineer, got a lot out of that talk. So yeah. Cool. Um, so yeah, the problem with mutating variables and assigning them back to the same name is essentially you are assigning multiple definitions to the same variable at different points in time in your notebook. And because of the way that notebooks work, you can obviously retain the definition which might be outdated or incorrect in your uh, Jupyter environment. And then that can lead to mistakes or confusion. So instead, what I prefer to do is rename any variable that I've mutated with a name that clearly reflects either the transformation applied to it or the intended function. So for example, with my training variable um, here, I've unrolled it so it can be passed to one particular type of model. Here, I've prepared it in such a way that it's appropriate for convolutional neural nets. Down here with my targets, I've made them categorical. So I've just put a little indicator. So it just gives you that extra information about what this is and what you did to it. So on the flip side, it's also tidier to avoid assigning intermediate data processing steps to variables when you can do it in one go. And we talked about this quite extensively on Tuesday with uh, Matt's presentation about pandas. If you are interested in this topic, I do recommend going back to that webinar because he really goes into this in a lot of detail. I'm just gonna touch on it briefly. It's, you can see here, it's pretty obvious. What I've done is I've imported my train and test data. And what this contains is all of my feature columns and one target column. So in order to create all of my features, essentially what I want to do is take this data frame drop the target, transform everything to NumPy, and then reshape it to the desired format. And if I were trying to do that with the kind of like usual pandas workflow where I'd assign it to like X, X without, <laughs> without target, and then maybe X NumPy, X reshape, it's just, it's a mess. You don't need all these extra variables. Um, another thing, this is called a, a chaining method, or this is at least the, the name that Matt gives it. Um, you can take advantage of this notation in Python where you insert things that you want to spread across multiple lines within parentheses. You can, of course, also use the escape notation, but I think within parentheses is much easier to read and much more elegant. Okay, so another thing that's really important is obviously analyses within notebooks can get very complicated and very long. And as that happens, your cognitive load gets higher. It gets harder to think clearly. It gets harder to focus on what you're trying to do at a particular point in time. So when I'm not using data law, what I would normally do is break the different parts of my project into different distinct notebooks. And that's fine. But the problem is you then face issues where you need to link each of those notebooks back to the environment and to the data source. Again, these first steps with reproducibility. So a really cool feature, I really love this feature of data law, is you can actually split one notebook into different tabs, what they're called sheets in data law notation. And you can see them down here. I've broken this uh, notebook into five different sheets. So the first is for just the setup, importing my dependencies, importing my data, doing my transformations. Then I do my first experiment. Then I just do a bit of visualization to check whether my target is separating out properly. Then I do my second model. And then finally, I apply my model to my test data set. So this is just such a nice feature because the thing I really want to stress, even though this looks like five different notebooks, if I were to go back to my first cell here, press run or press run all, it would continuously run through every single cell until we hit this cell here. I'm not going to do it. It's quite a big notebook. It's going to take a while to run. Um, but yeah, just take my word for it. Um, and this really just 
strikes strikes that nice balance between needing new notebooks to have that headspace to think clearly and you know actually having uh, multiple notebooks that you need to maintain in terms of data connections and environment. Okay, so there's a couple of nice other tools that Data Law has for reducing cognitive load. So if you've used other JetBrain tools, you'll be familiar with some of these. But the first I want to show is that Data Law has a very nice inbuilt linter to flag unused declarations, such as unused package imports or unused functions or variables. So you can see it here. It's telling me there's something wrong with SciPy import stats. If I hover over it, it's telling me that I haven't used this import statement, so I should probably get rid of it. And it's just a really nice way of going through and tidying up your notebook at the end to make sure that you don't have excessive code, that oh, sorry, extra code that was never used and therefore might be confusing later. You've also seen the code completion features. I showed you that with the path completion. Again, it's the same very rich code completion you might be familiar with from PyCharm if you're using that or Data Spell. Another nice feature that Data Law has is an inbuilt documentation on Hover. So I'm just going to show you that here. I've got MP Arrange imported. And if I just click on it and I hover, you can see that I'm getting all the documentation that I would get if I went to the NumPy page. If I scroll through, you can see that I'm getting examples of how to use it, definitions of the parameters without having to leave the development environment. And the combination of the linter, the documentation on Hover, and the code completion completion, sorry, really gives you a much nicer coding experience than working in pure Jupyter. It helps you make a lot less mistakes and be quicker and much more efficient. And of course, that then makes your code more reproducible because you're not going to make mistakes that break the code. Now, the last thing that I wanted to show in the what did I do question is a kernel mode that Data Law has, which forces changes in a cell to affect all dependent cells below it. And it's called reactive mode. This is the kernel mode that I was talking about at the beginning. Yeah, <laughs> the killer feature. So what you can see here is I have this particular notebook. And if I go here to kernel, you can see I've got reactive mode toggled on. It's also toggled on down the bottom here. And so it means I can turn it on and off within the same notebook. You know, you're probably thinking, how does it work? Can you just show me? OK. So. What you can see here is I've created this matrix, and it's a three by four matrix. And let's say that I needed a particular element from that matrix stored in a variable. So here I've extracted it, and it's stored with the value slice result as 11. But let's say I change my mind, and I decide to make it a three by five matrix. Now, normally, if reactive mode wasn't enabled, or I was in vanilla Jupyter, which doesn't have it, and I run this cell, but I don't run this cell, slice result will be retained in memory as a value of 11. Let's see what happens if I just run this cell with reactive mode enabled. And there you can see, automatically, the new definition of central, sample matrix has flowed through to this cell, even though I haven't run it explicitly, and it's executed it and updated the value to 13. Yeah, it's really cool. So this obviously overcomes a lot of issues with reproducibility because you cannot change something in one cell without affecting all the cells that are dependent on it. Okay, so we're finally done with what did I do? The rest of the presentation is going to be pretty quick, but uh, let's just pause quickly. Any questions, Paul? Sure. First, a comment. That reactive oh. mode stuff's pretty cool. That's badass. It's just and you're just so showing it single user mode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. And um, Paul's alluding to something that I'm going to be showing very Indeed, quickly, very, wanna... very soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But we have an amazing collaborative mode. Um, you you and... think that was badass? The next thing, the next thing is going to be badass. Um, you were talking about cognitive load, mm. and um, you got any suggestions on the right best practices to include markdown to kind of ensure reproducibility? The topic of your title, but in my mind, it's more about cognitive load for the current you, the future you, your colleagues and stuff like that. Yeah, so this is something I'm going to be showing a bit more of in the coming section. But essentially, Markdown is severely underutilized, I think, in most notebooks. And I think it's because, honestly, most people, by the time you get to the point where you need to be writing your Markdown, you're sick of it. You're done. Like, you've done all your thinking and you're over it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a doc string for a function. 
Exactly. And dock string should also be part of your reproducibility, as we've yep. already discussed. But it's essentially like the markdown is a chance to, in as readable a fashion as possible, just put down every bit of thinking that you've had in the project. So what decisions did I make that the code is not going to reflect? Mm -hmm. um, you know, why did I choose this particular package? Like why did I choose PyTorch rather than TensorFlow? Or why did I choose a decision tree rather than a neural net? Um, where did I get the data from? Why did I choose this sample? Like just decisions. And mm -hmm. Like, I think I remember when I was preparing for this talk six years ago, I did a lot of reading about why Jupyter Notebooks were created with Markdown. And it's the idea that I think even more than software engineering, because again, you're doing research, there are a lot of parts of the process that are implicit assumptions and decisions mm -hmm. that are entirely subjective. And well, again, there is subjectivity to software engineering, but I think it's a bit more explicit in the code. Whereas with research, you really, really need to understand why you made particular assumptions and decisions. Mm -hmm. And that's what the markdown is vital for. Um, if I could make a plug for something you made a plug for, oh. which was um, you're talking about Data Lore's cool feature about showing you pop up documentation uh, on a function. So if you could put your mouse over one of those. Mm. Um, do reshape this time okay and you might say to yourself oh i you know everybody knows what reshape i don't need any help for that but what about your own functions earlier you wrote a uh, function you gave it a nice long title mm -hmm. extra work to give it a good doc string and put type hints mm -hmm. on the arguments yes means the future you or other people instead of having to stop what they're doing and go read the code, can just do this little mouse over. Exactly, exactly. And just kind of this is not on data law, but like a similar feature that you have in JetBrains IDEs is that ability to go inside functions. So this was something that was vital when I was trying to work with that legacy project in order to understand <laughs> the provenance of a particular functions. Um yeah, it's super important to have the right tooling to yeah. support. Yeah. So, yeah, like you said, it's a combination of writing the right functions with the right documentation and then having the right tooling that actually helps you interact with them. If I can kind of make the case for data lore a little bit, uh, there's a difference between uh, an off-the-shelf tool that you can get the job done versus something where you stay in the flow it's got all these things to reduce your cognitive load and keep you focused on what you're supposed to be working on mm -hmm. and it's interesting because i think like, we we talked about this before paul but like for many years i think i was not that worried about tooling like i was like whatever mm -hmm. just vanilla mm -hmm. jupiter it's fine and it's not until you start taking advantage of of good tooling you actually realize, okay, I was actually wasting a lot of time and energy in fighting things that I didn't need to. Um, and then yeah. you realize actually you can be getting on with doing data science or data analysis rather than trying to work, right. out, work out S3's authentication system. Love you, S3, but uh, that can be difficult. Yeah. So, yeah. So, sorry, onward. Onward. Okay. So I promise we're on the home stretch. So this uh, gives us a nice segue into the why did I do it question. And I think we pretty much already covered why markdown is so important. So essentially, you just really need to do all this documentation. And this, again, this is a step like the, the coding practices I just talked about, where there is no silver bullet. This is Work you have to put in. It is a bit tedious if you don't like writing. I do, so sorry. But um, And it's just unavoidable. Like you just need to make sure that you've documented decisions. So let me give an example. Um, so in this second tab, essentially what I've done here is documented the baseline model that I've created. So in this analysis, I use two different uh, models, a baseline model and a convolutional neural net, just a model that's a bit more appropriate for image processing. But this baseline model is just, it's a ridiculously stupid neural net. It is 
it's basically a logistic regression. It's a very dumb and not very appropriate model for the purpose. But the reason that I did it was because you need to basically test whether your data has signal. Can I actually separate out the 10 different clothing types that I'm trying to predict with a very stupid model? And this is ML Beck's practice. But if I didn't know this, I'd be like, why did I choose this model when I come back later? I'm like, I'd be like, the hell am I an idiot? Like, <laughs> didn't, did I do any reading in this area? So you can see I've taken advantage of all of the features you can get with Markdown. You know, you've basically got some um, formatting. You have bullet points. I have an explanation in paragraphs with headings on why I did what I did. And I've even got a link back to the reference using um, a hyperlink notation. So it's just a way of making sure that that decision making that would seem very bizarre later is documented clearly when I come back to it or I share this with someone else. So I'm just going to jump to the next section, Paul, and then I'm going to pause for questions because this next section is very short. So the next question I'm going to answer is when did I make changes? We're racing through. We're almost done. Um, so obviously we do need some sort of versioning. We need to make sure that there are checkpoints that keep track of major and important changes that are made. And so as I said at the beginning of the presentation, I used to use Git for this. But as I discussed earlier, Git does have some limitations for Jupyter. One is the technological barrier. A lot of people are just really not comfortable traversing commit, commit, ga, commit graphs to get back the, to their earlier work. Um, and also, and this is again something that I talked about in the webinar on, on Tuesday, tools like GitHub are not the nicest for visualizing diffs between Jupyter Notebooks because they essentially render the underlying structure of the notebook and it's super difficult to see what was actually changed. It's not semantic. Yeah, exactly. And it's because, again, we're trying to fit into tools that were designed for like plain text code documents. We're not, we're not software engineers. We are using different tools with a different purpose. So data law takes a different approach and what they do is they have an inbuilt history in the tool. So if I go to this, essentially what you can see is I have two fully rendered notebooks and sorry, it's a little squishy because I'm very zoomed in. It looks a bit better when you've got your screen on normal resolution, but you can see if I scroll down here, it's just highlighting very clearly the differences in the code that were created. And this leads to the next question. Okay, obviously with Git, you can roll back. You can revert if you have changes where, you know, you realize you made a mistake. So how does data law treat this? Well, what it does is it will automatically create history checkpoints for you if it detects that you're going to do some sort of major change, like add or delete a sheet, add a cell, make changes like this. But you can also manually create your own checkpoints. And the nice thing is you can also see, and I'll get to collaboration in a second, you can see who made what change, exactly like with Git. So you can see that I made this change, Elena made these changes. So what do I do if I do want to revert back? So let's say I added a third experiment, third model. I thought, okay, this sucks, I'm going to get rid of it. I deleted it. But then I thought about it and I'm like, actually, I want it back. All I need to do is click here click on this button and it's one click to revert back to the original state. For me, it's much more friendly than using Git. I honestly do find Git a bit confusing. And I think for a lot of people who are, again, not coming from that engineering space, not using Git that often, this would be a more attractive option than having to, again, traverse commit graphs. I'm not gonna do this revert because I don't want to. All right, did you wanna pause for questions or do you want me to keep going? Sure. Let's go ahead and take one. Um, and this is the, again, you've made the point a few times. This is art, not science. Mm. Uh, if someone looks at that history and they've used our tools before, they'll be like, that's local history. I love local history. It saves me when Git can't help me because it's tied to like each IDE transaction, mm -hmm. you know, editor transaction. And you talked about, um, Checkpoints, history checkpoints, you got, we have the same thing in local history, but uh, when, how do you decide when to use them? I mean, it's, it's extra work. You, you don't like, 
oh yeah, I'm going to go back in time and put a checkpoint at that place because I'm really, I'm really screwed now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, for me, honestly, you don't need to think any differently than you would with Git, um, except thinking about it in the sense of you don't need to deal with things like merge conflicts and stuff like that. Like it's like a simpler version of Git mm -hmm. and you just think, okay, I'm about to make some massive change that's either going to fully fully mess up my work or fully mess up my collaborators, collaborator's work if it doesn't work. This is where you put in a checkpoint. So again, art, not science. Um, and again, this is this is how I would use Git as a data scientist. So sure. I think the, the concept translates very well. Sure. And um, this this side by side layout of this, you know, this semantically thing change that change is so much better than getting a JSON. And you might make a change that renders your notebook dead. Yeah. You know, because yeah, 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 yeah. serialization format. I um I have done that. <laughs> and I had to like, I think I ended up just uh like copying and pasting all the code sure. out to a new notebook. I didn't know what to do. <laughs> this was this was some time ago. But for confession, I've done some very ugly things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Get... yeah. Yeah, I've got another question, but I'll ask it a little bit later. Go on, go ahead on to the next thing. Cool. Yeah. And uh, we're moving now into the last question, which is talking about uh, the collaborative features, which answers the last question, who needs to access my work? So collaboration on data science projects isn't straightforward because teammates need to access a lot of things, you need to access not just the notebook, but also the environment in which you're working and the same data. And sometimes, depending on the type of work you're doing, they may want to ac access certain variables in your environment, like a model that took you six hours to train. You don't want to have to retrain that when you send it over to your collaborator. So this has been something that notebook type uh, programs have been thinking about for a while. So Google Colab actually had a collaborative mode, but they deprecated it back in 2017. And JupyterLab have only just introduced this as a, an experimental feature, like very recently. So for me and, you know, my own experience, it points to both the importance of the feature, but also the challenge of implementing it. But happily, the data law devs, very clever, have already implemented a very nice version of real-time collaboration. And this allows your collaborators to do this real proper collaboration. They can access the exact same computational environment, the interpreter, the dependencies, the data, anything that you've created in your Jupyter environment. They can access all of it. And the way we do this, it's really simple. I was talking about this at the beginning, but you essentially have a workspace. All you need to do is invite people to be collaborators in your workspace. And if they have a data law account, they can just get straight in. As soon as they join the notebook, they'll have access to everything you've created up to that point. Um, unfortunately, Elena couldn't join us today. She's normally my buddy for showing collaboration, but um, we have some very good examples of it on the website if you want to see it in action. So um, one other very cool feature about collaboration is you can create reports that are linked back to your notebook. So these are created directly from um, the notebook. So you can see here, if I scroll down a little bit, that I have, oops, uh, I have basically hidden the input and output of this particular cell. And the reason I've done this is you can see it's not hidden in my notebook, but if I go up here and I want to create a report, which I've already done, if I click over and go to it, doo -doo -doo, it will only display those cells that I haven't hidden, so the inputs and the outputs. And what this allows me to do is create a stripped down, simplified version of the notebook as a report. This also means you need to be very careful with the markdown you do, because if you create a report which doesn't have very sensible markdown, your report won't make any sense. So the nice thing about reports is, again, they're linked directly to the notebook. But secondly, you don't need to have a data law account in order to access a notebook. So if you have collaborators at your workplace or you know, if you're in research, you need to share something with them, but you don't want to pay for them to be a data law user, it's not really a problem. They can access it. 
But if you do have a collaborator who is a data law user and they're a collaborator in your workspace, you can simply click here and they can access the full original notebook with that full collaborative mode that I was talking about. I love this feature, I just find it super cool. So that's actually everything I had to discuss. I'm gonna do like a brief summary just to go over all the points we've discussed, but I think maybe we just stop for one last question. Oh, you're muted. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Paul, Paul, you're muted. <laughs> it's bound to happen. <laughs> it is my superpower. And you were really getting into it. So yeah. I was like, yes, yes. It was yeah. mime. It was a mime it's interpretation. Fine. I know. I, I need to learn to, to yeah. lip read. <laughs> yeah. I see Khaled is here too, reminding me that I'm unmuted. Um, you were just talking about uh, collaboration. Mm. And just before that, you were talking about how history lets you work safely. And those yeah. two actually work together. I was talking with the data lore team in chat just to confirm that the uh, history is a server side history. And yeah. so if you do something and someone else goes to history, they'll see your transaction in that and they can diff it and roll it back and all that other kind of stuff. And so the tying together of those two features becomes a very powerful thing for working together. It's one thing to be able to work together but maybe you want to recover from the consequences. Yeah, collaboration, two-sided two sword, right? Yeah, yeah. And again, this is the thing that I want to stress. It is so much more intuitive, I think, for non-engineers than working with Git. Like you don't need to worry about merge conflicts. You don't need mm -hmm. to worry about having to cherry pick and traverse the, the commit graph and revert back to the previous hash and... All of those oh. fun things. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, so one last question and then kind of one parting on the way out the mm. door question. Um, dashboards, kind of a big thing, big thing mm. in data lore. Um, yep. Can you do dashboards from these notebooks and all of that kind of stuff? Not yet, but they are like a top feature. So yeah. I think the team is planning them within the next couple of months as part of their rollout. Right. Um, but yeah, okay. these are heavily, heavily requested and they really want to move data law from just a reporting tool to a proper analytics dashboarding tool. And you might have seen as well, we have the ability to schedule notebooks now. So say if you are working in say a BI capacity and you need to run a weekly or a monthly report, you can actually schedule those. So your report will update and then soon they will be dashboards. All right. We've got a question from uh, Khalid, uh, who's like channeling the inner Paul. <laughs> he and I talk about this constantly about web apps and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, from an engineer's perspective, how does an organization go from a notebook to app usage, which is a little bit like what you were just giving the vision for, for mm. dashboards? Do you know of any plans to take a notebook and turn it into kind of a runnable hosted model API kind of thing? I understand. Yeah, yeah, exactly what he's talking about. So essentially the way that say SageMaker does it where you can serve endpoints. Um, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I saw Fast API was a dependency that was included by default, I think. Hmm. I think so. I can't answer this one off the top of my okay. head. This is one we're de definitely going to have to go to the team for. But from a vision perspective. Exactly, yeah. So at the moment, the team has been more heavily focused on, say, the Jupyter experience and the reporting experience. And it's because the positioning of this tool is less on the production side and more on the research side. So, sure. yeah. So in terms of that side of data science capacity it's not a uh, like a, a focus kind of mm -hmm. philosophically. Um, I couldn't tell you specifically though where it sits on the roadmap. But I just got a little mention from chat. Yes. Yes, it, there are plans for such oh, things. Oh, 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 oh. And that would gotten, be epic. That would be amazing. Yeah. Especially yeah. in an environment, it can be sure the enterprise can be on premises. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But... You can let the pager be worn by the good folks at JetBrains. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Hey, 
So hopefully, Kylie, we got a good enough answer for you. Uh, that's the I think we got the answer you and I both wanted. So thumbs up to your exclamations. Yes. Uh, question on the way out the door, Jody. Mm. On the topic of your talk, um, what should people prioritize for reproducibility? Yeah. So the unsexy answer, and I've already sort of alluded to this, is all of the stuff that's in your head or in your team's head that you know you're going to forget later. So this is the code, making sure it's tidy and readable. This is the markdown documentation. These are kind of the big things you really need to prioritize. Stuff about environment, it's super important, but just making sure can you reproduce the exact results and can you understand the decision making? That's key. Being able to again, reproduce that environment or marry up things like a model that's created from this workflow or a report. They're important, very important, mm -hmm. but the most important stuff is get what's up here into that notebook and be sure you can understand it six months later. Because if you can't understand it six months later, your collaborators are not going to be able to understand it this week. Yeah. And unfortunately, I think you're telling people the most important thing is the one that they want to do the least i know it's it's so boring <laughs> but it's so important but, but six months from now you're not going to remember anything be kind to your future self write mm -hmm. a couple of sentences exactly exactly yeah. even if it's just some bullet points yeah yeah before we start the closeout, you got anything uh, that you need to show before heading out the door i do actually we wouldn't mind getting the share screen back up again okay I have a few things to show. So the first is I'm going to do a shameless plug for my Twitter. Um, what I'll be doing is I'll be sharing a copy of that report that I showed. So you can essentially Good. see the notebook and get an idea of what I was talking about. Um, the next is the data law Twitter. So please follow them if you want to get updates on latest releases. Um, Elena is maintaining this. She's doing an absolute stellar job. So anything that's coming out, you'll be the first to know about it if you follow her on Twitter. Um, if you want to try out Data Law yourself, like I said, we have a free community edition. So I can't go and show you the, the landing page because this will take me to those notebooks that I'm showing you because I'm logged in. But go to <laughs> datalaw.jetbrains.com and that will send you to a landing page and then just sign up for that free edition to give it a spin. And then we have the JetBrains data blog log. This will be, again, a source of truth to get all the updates on what's happening. And then the final is the fantastic documentation. Um, this documentation is great. Like I remember when I was first learning the tool, I it wasn't quite clear how to connect to an S3 bucket. Looked up the documentation, I did it in two minutes. So very clear, very friendly. So that's it. How about the finally, finally, what about your blog? Oh, yes. Let me get that up. And this is a blog that people that you actually put content on. I do. I do. Although I missed a blog post this week because <laughs> two webinars. Um, but yeah, I'm roughly trying to release a new blog post a week. Um, What's your next through, topic? Um, I'm going to be talking about broadcasting in NumPy. So this is a bit of a mind melting concept, but I think right. I finally got my head around how to explain it. Um, but yeah, it's a really I'm nice trick. Yeah, that. it's a really nice trick for basically speeding up large vector operations. Um, it uses like a trick that NumPy does under the hood rather than needing to create big objects in memory. So NumPy, NumPy is brilliant. NumPy is is pure love. And if people say to themselves, I can't get enough of that voice of Jody's, what <laughs> might I be able to get in the future? The answer would be. Uh, yes. So I have another webinar coming up next month. So I'm collaborating with a company called Gina AI, and I'll be talking actually about these sort of topics. So broadcasting, um, Vectorization. vectorizations, things like that. Um, I will be doing a real Python podcast episode towards the end of the summer on natural language processing, actually talking to Chris about that tomorrow. So very All exciting. Right. And I have a presentation at NDC Oslo in September. So if you're going to be there, I would love you to come along. We'll be talking about data screening and cleaning, which is very cool and exciting. Busy schedule. I signed up for your um, meetup with Gina uh, today. So Yay. I encourage everyone else to 
Let's go ahead and start the process of wrapping up, Jody's. All right. Yes, let's do it. All right. Uh, Thanks a lot, Jody. This has been a deep dive on prof what I would say professional or industrial or durable notebooks uh, using data spell. A lot we could talk about on this topic. Um, I know that for as long as you and I have been talking about this concept has been really important to you. So kind of just thanks for going over all this with us. Yeah. And like, thank you everyone for attending. Um, like I said, Please reach out on Twitter if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer them. And look, at, this tool is very exciting. So please do give the free community edition a go. Give us your feedback. Um, we're, it's a pretty new product, so we're always evolving the features. We really want to hear from you. So, yeah, thank you for coming. And you may be asking yourself out there, wow, Joey's done all this work. She's pre-chewed my food for me, gotten this delivered. What can I do to help you can answer the after webinar survey. We actually read this. Tell us what you think, what we could do better on, what topics you'd like Jody to cover in the future, or feel free to contact us on Twitter. Uh, Jody, do you do any of the, the data lore Twitter? Um, I'm temporarily filling in for Elena at the Got moment. Right. Um, but yes, if you do want to get any questions, I will be receiving them happily. So send us some tweets. There are some highly overqualified people on the other end of that tweet who will be replying to you. So that's all for us today. Thanks a bunch, everyone, for joining us. Hope you have a nice day. Thank you so much. Ciao.